Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. This is the last energy seminar for uh, winter quarter. Uh, we will be off next week, um, March 22nd, and return uh, with Brad Page on March 29th, uh, right at the beginning of spring quarter. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Alicia Green, the General Manager of Information Technology Engineering at Chevron. Uh, students among you may be interested to know that she was a, a student here in mathematical and computational sciences, kind of an innovative program then and now, uh, and also a, a stalwart member of the a women's track team here at Stanford. Uh, so, uh, I, I think she has a, a great perspective on the Stanford community. Uh, she's been at uh, Chevron for a few decades now and uh, worked her way up uh, to a general manager uh, position amongst many other uh, stops along the way. Again, for the students, she also does IT recruiting. I just learned uh, a few minutes ago that her husband is actually a Stanford uh, uh, a Stanford CS uh, grad. So, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Alicia Green to speak to us today about digital transformation in the energy sector. By the way, Chevron has been the dominant supporter of the energy seminar for at least uh, 10 or 15 years and maybe more. So Alicia, thank you, thank you, thank you on many uh, levels. Please take it away. Well, John, thank you so much for uh, that warm introduction, and it's uh, great to, uh, you know, be back virtually anyway on the farm. Um, so I'm actually here in uh, Tomball, Texas, which is uh, north of Houston, and as uh, John said, yes, I am a proud uh, Stanford alum, and I Actually, I was hoping that I would be back there this year. We're still fingers crossed. I don't think they've completely um, canceled our reunion yet, but this will be a big 3-0 um, reunion at Stanford. Uh, if, uh, you know, so hopefully, you know, all will be good in October and I can actually come back to campus uh, for that reunion. I love coming, coming back to campus. Um, and so as, as John said, you know, I have a mathematical and computational sciences degree and um, I've worked at Chevron uh, the whole time since um, leaving Stanford, which is uh, quite unusual amongst the folks that I uh, graduated with. Uh, it is a very large multinational company. And though I've been at the same company, you know, for all of these years, I think I'm on my 14th or 15th different role. Uh, this is actually my second time in Houston. Uh, I started uh, there in, in California. That's where our headquarters are, uh, is in San Ramon, California. So about 35 miles uh, east of campus. Um, and then I, I was here in Houston um, in the early 2000s. I was in Louisiana uh, for about five years. I did about two and a half years in Bangkok, then came back to California. Uh, I was actually in California for about another three or so years before I moved here. And we've been here this time since uh, 2018. Um, I also have a, a daughter who just graduated um, uh, college, not Stanford. She went to Wake Forest, but she graduated uh, last year and is now living in Los Angeles. So that's a little bit about myself. And um, so I'm here today to, to talk to you a bit about uh, the digital transformation uh, that's going on in the energy sector. And I know that, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, sharing some information with you, but then also, you know, answering questions, um, you know, as they come and then also um, leave, leave time for sure at the end. So let's go to the first slide here. So just have a couple of slides um, just to kind of help with, with some of the dialogue. So from a standpoint of, of what, you know, the company, our company Chevron believes, you know, energy is essential. It really, you know, enables human progress, you know, across the world. And if you look really across the world, not everyone has, you know, energy, you know, today. Um, you know, we take for granted here, you know, in the U.S. that you flick on a light and, you know, pretty much hopefully the lights will come on and that's not, you know, so in many areas of the world. And so that's really what we see as our um, vital purpose um, in the world is to deliver the energy that enables human progress. Cause you can really track, um, 
you know, the having that affordable energy to people getting to a different, um, you know, lifestyle, you know, being able to get out of poverty into, um, you know, middle class and other areas, a lot of that can be contributed to countries and their ability to have the energy. And we do think that it needs to be both affordable um, and reliable. We also feel that um, we need to protect the environment in which we work. And you can see on here for us, that means the air, water, land, and the climate. Um, and so we are very much supporters of the, um, you know, the Paris, um, you know, peace accord, the, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, um, energy. And we really do support, you know, a price um, on carbon. We think it takes all form of, of energy to really meet that, the energy demands um, of, of the world. And, um, you know, we have um, uh, made commitments, both financial as well as from a, you know, employee standpoint across all forms um, of energy. And then ultimately, it really is going to take innovation to meet all of our challenges. Um, and that's across, you know, kind of all aspects of the value chain. Um, you know, when it comes to manufacturing, you know, doing that in, you know, in different ways, uh, electricity, you know, being able to, um, you know, get electricity, um, you know, both from a renewable standpoint, um, in the agriculture and the transport, when you think about, you know, going into, you know, from a renewable space, um, you know, some of the things really are about the infrastructure and the scale and scope of uh, the renewable energy to make it something uh, that can be used, um, you know, across the globe and really meet the demand that not only are those that are used to having reliable energy have, but as I said, those other countries that are wanting to have the energy that they currently don't have. And, and we don't see this, you know, by ourselves. We, we look to make partnerships and um, really partner with other entities, um, <clears throat> uh, both from a, you know, scientific uh, standpoint uh, that we really see that will help then accelerate um, the advances across the world. When, you, when I talk, talk about, say, advancing the carbon future, there are kind of three areas that, that we are looking at. Um, you know, we are looking to, first of all, lower our carbon intensity um, of the current operations um, that we have. Um, the second piece is really increasing the renewables, right? And so we think this is an and world. It's not one of these, it's all of these together. And so increasing the, uh, the, the amounts of renewables we have and the, off, the offsets um, that, that support um, various, you know, various businesses we have and even extending or going into different uh, businesses. And then we look to invest in lower carbon uh, technologies. We, we actually have a wing um, of the company that's basically a tech ventures um, wing. And, and what that does is that looks for uh, companies and, and a lot of the companies are in the renewable space and we provide different rounds of funding um, for those companies. And, so, and also in some cases, not just the funding, but places to actually test out um, these new technologies in an already, you know, existing space. So it's a very um, really good symbiotic relationship where it helps the assets that we already have to perform better. Um, and then it helps the companies to um, really test out uh, their new technology in a, um, you know, actual functioning operational setting. Okay. So from a, a Chevron standpoint, you know, we're, um, you know, different uh, energy companies have different portions, maybe of the value chain, we're really involved in all aspects of the value chain. So this is just, just excuse me, this is just a snippet to show um, basically our company's coverage. So we go from upstream through downstream and what you see here is a very simplistic uh, pictorial of what upstream through downstream means um, within Chevron. So, in, so from an upstream standpoint, that's where we explore for, um, you know, so look, explore, find, and then produce um, the oil and gas. Midstream, 
is that wing of being able to transport, um, whether it's via vessel or pipeline. And there's also a commercial aspect in there of trading. And then our downstream really picks up at the manufacturing plant where we take that um, you know, um, oil or gas and then refine it. And then it goes into the marketplace then where I'm sure many of you then go out and buy our lovely product that is fueled with Tecron. So now let's let's jump into so what where's the intersection then from a, a digital uh, standpoint? So um, you know it's it's interesting because there it, you know if you ask many different people within the company um, you you'd get different answers. Um, you know there you know about like how long have we been on this digital journey? Many would say for decades um, because we have been using digital technologies for many decades. It just might not have been called digital then. When you like, for instance, the third piece that you see on here, the industrial internet of things, while that has become the name, you know, that, that we've given things say over the last three to four years, um, I mean, in the energy industry, we've been doing that for quite a while. When you think about like the sensors um, that we've had at our various plants, I mean, that that's what really the industrial internet of things, it's that blurring, right, of the kind of physical and the digital. And, you know, in order for us to really operate these highly complex uh, plants, whether they be in the manufacturing side or, you um, in our upstream part of the business where especially our uh, liquefied natural gas uh, plants where you know basically you've got you've got many chemical reactions um, that are going on in order to take the gas you know go find the gas it's in its gaseous state and in order to be able to store it you have to take the uh, temperature down and put it under pressure in order for it to get into its liquid state, in order for it to then be put on a vessel that stays in that cooled, very, very cooled state and under pressure in order to transport it um, usually from where that natural, the natural habitat of the gas is to where the demand is. So we've been doing that for, I mean, we're, we're uh, you know, over a 140 year old company. So we've been doing that for a long time. Um, it's just in the last, you know, like I said, you know, maybe four or five years where now the buzz has become, you know, this digital buzz and, inter, you know, industrial internet of things. And so um, you talk to a lot of our engineers or geoscientists or geophysicists, and they're like, well, we've been doing this for a long time. You think about, say, like our, you know, like our 3D. Um, imaging that we do in order to find the, you know, the reservoirs and to really assess um, how much hydrocarbon is in those reservoirs. We've been doing that for a really long time. So what's different now? Well, what's different, and, and I think it's the, it's the thing, you know, if you've heard about the fourth industrial revolution, it really is the difference in bringing together many of these different technologies um, as well as the advancements that we've had from a compute uh, perspective. You know, so the high performance computing that you see, I mean, we've had high performance computing for a really long time. Um, you know, if we didn't have high performance computers, our uh, geologists and geophysicists wouldn't able to be to be able to do that earth modeling interpretation that they've done, you know, for decades and decades. The difference now is the type of compute power, it, you know, allows us to do that even more quickly. And then being able to, we've had the sensors, um, you know, like I said, on our operational equipment, the difference now is the ability to in real time capture the data from those sensors and to have that say flow through, um, you know, statistical models that allows us to do statistical analysis. Whereas in the past, a lot of times our engineers would have to spend the time to get all of that information. So the information would come out, it wouldn't necessarily be real time. It would come to them, but then they'd have to put it into a spreadsheet. They'd have to massage the data 
um, you know, get it, you know, and then be able to combine that data, maybe, you know, that reservoir data with some other operational type of data. And by the time they did all of that, maybe a week had passed. And then finally, they were able to get to the analysis. And that analysis now was on very old information. So the difference now with, you know, the ability to have, um, you know, cloud compute and your, um, you know, your, your sensors, and then being able to get to real time information, and being able to put that, like, say, into data lakes, and combine that data, put it into a model, and then let our engineers actually do the analysis in real time, and then being able to make decisions in real time. That's a lot of the difference. So we've always been, um, I, I remember a colleague of mine has had said for, for years, we for many, for many years have been data rich, but information poor. We've had all this data you know, at our fingertips, but not really being able to um, utilize uh, this data. And so that's what's different. When I think of other industries, you know, for them, it's all about going and getting the sensors. So, the, for, so for them, the industrial internet of things is, let me go put sensors on all this stuff. And now, oh, all of a sudden, I have all this information that I didn't have before. Now, what do I do with it? And for us, that wasn't the thing. It was like, how do I get all this massive information and, uh, and make some sense of it? So let me just give you kind of a few more specific, tangible um, applications of, of what we've done. And, um, and then the journey that I'd, I'd say it's more of an acceleration as opposed to a start, but it's really the acceleration and focus that we've been on um, over the last couple of years. So one of our things um, that, that we've looked to do really is as our um, assets um, become more complex, we look to put uh, what we call advanced process control um, systems within uh, those assets. So like one of our, our newer assets that we brought online is in Australia um, and it's, a, it's called Gorgon. Um, it's a it's it's an offshore field um, near Perth, Australia. The uh, it's a liquefied natural gas. Uh, so this is a gas field, um, and the um, the plant itself actually sits on a um, what I, for, I forget the, what the specific um, Australian designation is, but think of it as a highly regulated. Um, uh, kind of natural sanctuary. Um, and so we have a energy plant on there. We, we had to go through many things for the, uh, the country to let us put our plant there to show that we were not gonna impact the environment or even the animals in any way. And just a, a fun fact there, we, we basically had to go and monitor that the turtles uh, that are out there that we did not interrupt their mating uh, plans. And so when you go out there and I, um, you know, before all this COVID stuff hit and we used to be able to go on those things, you know, that fly in the air and people sit next to each other, go on planes and stuff. Um, I was able to take a trip um, out there. And before you go out there, you have to go through and understand that this is a natural preserve. And, uh, you know, you take training before you go out there. Uh, and in that training, it talks about how, you know, to properly clean all of your clothing before you go out there, um, your shoes and everything. And then as you go to get on the plane, before you get out there, they check your shoes, there's brushes and everything that you have to put on because they want no uh, foreign fauna introduced into um, that area. Um, and, and you go out and it's, it, I mean, and it's, it's actually paradise out there. Um, so one of the things our advanced process controls um, help us with, one, it helps us so we don't have to have as many people um, out on the plant. 
because uh, we can have more sensors that help to really control the operations. The other thing, as opposed to people having to go and check all of the facilities and make sure that you've got, I mean, I, I talked you a bit through of what you've got to do is you bring in the gas in, you've got to, you know, lower the pressure. I mean, you've got to increase the pressure and lower the temperature to these, you know, really ridiculous temperatures. Well, again, instead of humans having to go out and make sure that we're at the right temperature or pressure, we've got sensors doing that. And then those sensors then relay data back to Perth, um, where our office is, and people can then sit in the office and it's real time information then that the engineers get, and then they're able to really control the plant from, you know, many, many, you know, kilometers away from the actual uh, site. Um, another example of some of the, the technologies that we're, we're, that we're using, um, staying in the Asia area in our Singapore area, we have a, um, a chemical plant there. And, you know, safety is, uh, you know, our top priority. Uh, and one of the things that we've done there to, um, as we say, we like to make sure that we have safeguards in place. So we look at a lot of these digital um, uh, technologies as a way to put a digital safeguard in place and to go from I think somebody is safe to I know that they are safe. So by um, being able to use um, RFID um, tags on folks, we're able to see where they are and e even monitor, like, are they upright? So we can see if someone, say, has um, fallen in the plant, we will be able to be notified of that. And then we'll be able to get their latitude and longitude, and we'll know exactly where they are, and then personnel can be um, sent directly to them. The other thing is as we have, um, say, various activities going on in the plant, um, instead of, say, putting up, you know, uh, some cones to say, hey, don't go here, there's some sort of, you know, you know chemical uh, type of procedure going on, we're using geofencing. And so the geofencing then allows and kind of sends a little buzz to say, oh, don't go there. Uh, so it's a very much a smart plant uh, that we have there. Um, uh, which again is a lot of the, the use of many of these of these areas that we've got. Another, another thing that we're looking um, that we're doing across many of our uh, facilities is really um, utilizing um, you know unmanned aerial systems. And the, the use case there is um, you know currently we have various inspections that we need to do. Um, and um, to look at doing those inspections by utilizing drones instead of having people do that. Because again, that will help remove people um, from potentially hazardous situations they can find space. Like vessel, even though the vessel will be cleaned out, there could still be like residual fumes. And so we like to not have people do that. And so being able to utilize drones to be able to go into those spaces. And then also, again, as opposed to having the human eye figuring things out, now you can go in and have, you know, these drones with very, um, you know, high definition cameras and have the cameras do the viewing. And in some cases, you know, being, being able to have the cameras bring things back and then do, you know, like photo analysis to see what does that look like? So you could look for say defects that maybe the naked eye couldn't even see. So that even further helps from a safety uh, and reliability standpoint. The other thing um, that that we've that we've done, where we've used uh, data science, and that's something close to my heart. As you heard, I have a mathematical and computational sciences degree, and I tell all the data scientists who are at Chevron now that I was a data scientist before it was cool, because that's all mathematical and computational sciences is. Is it's really what we're calling data science uh, today. And, um, and so some of the things that we've looked to do there when we, like when I said, we talk about our maintenance is, is instead of having say some of our equipment be on a time-based maintenance um, uh, procedures, we go more to predictive based. And so, you know, where you would take um, say, say for, we have a decision support center for our rotating equipment and we have uh, turbines and compressors, like about 2000 across the company. And basically we can get all of the data that comes back from the, again from the sensors that is on that rotating equipment. 
and really look at the history of the equipment and look at it across the whole fleet and then predict when we think there'll be an incident and then take that piece of equipment out of service before there is an incident. Um, and then, so what that allows us to do then is have people then go to the site before there's an incident. Um, and then when they go, they actually know what the issue is. And so they go, we have the right people that go there with the right tools. Um, and again, that can help um, prevent any sort of safety you know, incident that there could be, but uh, more importantly, it, it helps with the reliability of our plants. And so then we can do controlled takedowns of equipment as opposed to equipment failing um, you know, and, and not being um, expected to. Um, the, uh, the last one that I'll, that I'll mention is we also have um, a, uh, a, another decision support center, as we called it, called the Well Deck. Um, and dur during there, it's actually located here in Houston, uh, where I am, um, and really all of our complex wells across the company are monitored uh, from, from this place. Think of, think of a very like large room um, and with huge monitors like on the wall that kind of show where all of the wells are being drilled all around the world. And we've got about 10 to 15 people sitting in there. And, and those 10 to 15 people have these huge desks with monitors of their own. And they're able to see um, what the drilling, how the drilling is going. And it's think of it as like expert set of eyes to really help the people um, that are on the ground. And again, and to bring in maybe, um, you know, analog information from another similar well that was drilled to help drill that well better. And I mean, and again, in order to do that, we need, we need to be able to have, you know, cloud computing. We need, we need to be able to have our high performance computers. So it kind of brings all of these, these different things together. And I didn't mention the bottom right there, but it's really cru crucial. I mean, all of this that I'm talking about, cybersecurity is at the heart. Um, and so if you think about this flow of information, we want this flow of information to go to the approved people. And so cybersecurity becomes even more important than it was be before. So we build all of the different types of, of use cases that I just told you that have the various uh, digital technologies associated with them. Um, our principle is, you know, we build them secure, you know, and we make sure that, um, you know, our only, you know, our folks can get into it. And, and cybersecurity is kind of a never ending thing because all these technologies that I just told you about that we utilize in our business, well, the bad people are using them too, you know, so the bad people use data science to kind of figure things out of how they can get in, um, you know, to, uh, you know, systems that they shouldn't, you know, in the past, it used to always be, you know, build firewalls and keep people out. And now it's assume people will get in. And so now it is how do we detect very quickly? And then how do we, you know, detect, investigate, you know, boot out and recover. I mean, that's, that is our mantra. So we have a very um, sophisticated uh, cybersecurity um, uh, protocol that goes on uh, where we've got a basically a cybersecurity center, a um, uh, couple actually where we do kind of a follow the sun method. So we, we have constant monitoring uh, that's going on of both our business network as well as um, our industrial or kind of field network. Okay, let me see, see if I can see some of the questions here. I yeah, there's see. quite a few. I've been co coming through them, so pick, okay. you could either pick them out or I could uh, give you a few. Uh, why don't you give me a few, maybe that go with uh, with what with what I've been talking about? That'd be great. Uh, okay. Well, going way back, there is some uh, interest in uh, uh, carbon emission reduction. Just general background: carbon emission reductions and carbon pricing. What Chevron is doing and recommending. I do know. Uh, I think it was last week Chevron uh, issued its fourth climate change disclosure report. We did. Uh, called Climate Change Resilience Advancing a Low Carbon Future. I think it's unavoidable uh, 
in a talk like this, you'll get questions uh, regarding yes. that. Um, so I wonder if you could start with that and then we can get into some more of the IT and technology things you mentioned in more detail. Yeah. Yeah, so um, you know, as as I as I said before, you know, we have the the kind of the, the three pronged um, approach where, you know, we we are looking to, you know, significant significantly reduce our um, emissions, uh, you know, both through you know our GHG emissions, um, and we've got targets across um, our our value chain, uh, you know, to date. Um, our uh, greenhouse gas is down uh, 20%. Um, and our methane, methane and flaring intensity is down 50 to 60% since uh, 2016. And then we've got targets um, uh, for, we had, we had some 2023 targets uh, that, that we've already exceeded and we, we have announced new 2028, 2028 goals. Um, that expects to take us down another 35% uh, since uh, 20, 2016. Um, and so, you know, from a standpoint of the, uh, you know, from the carbon, um, the, the carbon kind of technologies, I mean, we're, I mean, a lot of what we're, we're focused on is really capturing um, carbon. So hopefully you all have maybe heard about um, our, you know, we just, I think we announced it a couple of weeks ago, a partnership between um, us and uh, so Chevron, uh, Schlumberger, uh, Microsoft, um, and a, uh, and, and a clean, clean company, clean energy systems company. And, and basically it's going to, you know, take uh, kind of the greenhouse gas carbon with um, basically some bio waste, um, that then gets uh, can get gasified. Um, there's also some air separation that goes on there. Um, and then there's through the clean energy systems, what they have is a power block that helps convert all of that into electricity. Um, and so those are those are kind of some of the things that we're doing um, in the carbon uh, carbon, kind of carbon capture and, and lowering of carbon space. And I would um, definitely, um, you know, uh, have you go to the, as uh, John said, the going to our, uh, our Chevron climate that we just, yeah, I think we just, I think that was out just last week because yeah, we were in our investors day. And I think right after that, we, we released that. So it's a nice, like about 70 page read, not too bad. Um, but it's got, it's got much more specifics about, you know, what we plan to invest in, you know, kind of lowering our carbon, where we're looking to increase our renewables and offsets. And then also the, what I just kind of explained to you, some of the lower carbon technologies we're looking to invest in. Super, there were a number of, uh, just another, before we get into the IT uh, area more uh, directly on uh, technologies that considered, could be considered to be silver bullets, game changers. Uh, I guess I would call them backstop technologies. So I'll just give you three that were explicitly mentioned, a deep hot geothermal direct air capture and sustainable ways to produce shale. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's a silver bullet, um, which is why, you know, we've been investing in many different companies, like I kind of said in the beginning. Um, and so, you know, for us, uh, we, we think it's going to take many different you know types we think it's going to take you know wind we think it's going to take solar we think the you know the the carbon you know we're, we're doing like carbon sequestration uh, things like that so we think it's going to take many different forms um, of energy and that there's not one silver bullet that's going to kind of get us to where we need to be from a greenhouse gas and you know lower emissions uh, perspective there's uh, one final question, just as an add on, because it keeps coming up. Uh, does uh, Chevron have a preferred way to do carbon pricing, either a way to do that or a number? Uh, you could think of many possible ways to do that. Uh, I understand the Biden administration is back into the uh, social cost of carbon uh, business, something that I've uh, worked on the last uh, five or 10 years as well. Um. 
You know, that's one. It's a little bit out of my area of expertise okay. on the carbon pricing. Um, I am, I've heard a little bit about that. And again, I think the specifics, I would definitely point you to our, um, you know, the release that we just had, because I think there are some ideas in there about how, okay. how we look to do carbon pricing. Okay, now back I just to wanna, your- I just wanna speak out of school on that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, if people are interested in that, I, I know Arthur Lee a bit, he could probably help us. I, I'm sure you know him. Yeah, well. yes, definitely. So, uh, back to your uh, directories of interest, which I'm uh, kind of overly interested in uh, as an energy environment person anyway, uh, having uh, started my career in uh, national security and whatnot. Uh, how do you think about that? A lot of questions on, wow, there's so many things going on. And uh, as you mentioned, Chevron uh, has been doing this kind of thing for a while, but for you personally, how do you keep track of all this stuff? And, <laughs> and uh, a lot of questions on how do you coordinate just your own stuff, let alone interfacing with uh, people who are doing things that could affect you or be affected by you. And then for me, as a, um, uh, national security analyst years and years ago, I shudder to think how bad this looks from a national, could look from a national <laughs> security point of view. I don't know. So uh, the other way of putting this, which somebody mm -hmm. did explicitly ask is how high uh, up in your list of risk to the company, either financially, public image, national security and whatnot is uh, cyber nowadays. Every time I hear a yeah. cyber expert talk, they always say, this may seem bad to you, but if I could tell you all I know, it would seem a lot wor worse, which I find yes. a bit uh, irritating because it just uh, uh, makes me, I find I'm very unsettled. So how do you think yeah. about that panoply of uh, 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 issues from where you sit as a uh, kind of expert and uh, person trying to deal with all these things simultaneously within your company? Yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, up there for us. I mean, this is, and I think for most companies, it's at the board level. Um, and so, you know, one of my colleagues, um, you know, is our, we have a chief, you know, information security officer. Uh, and, you know, we, we all have to partner together. So how, how do, I don't keep track of everything. That's probably the first thing, because otherwise I would not be sleeping. And I probably have more gray hairs in my head than, than no, that are already Now I don't feel so bad. <laughs> um, so, so I think the, the key for us in, in we do this across all of our corporation. We are very much a matrixed organization. Um, and what I mean by matrixed is we have, we, we look to have expertise that works as a team, you know, so, you know, they, we have cyber experts, you know, so we've actually say from a uh, talent management standpoint where some folks stay at Chevron as long as I have, you know, but we also hire from the outside. So we, we have many people, you know, as we started ramping up our cyber um, security practice, probably about five, six, seven years ago, you know, we, we hired some very skilled people like from our own government who are doing cyber security for that to come and help us. Um, yeah, this wasn't always a board topic. Um, you know, before, you know, when it was before, again, you put buzzwords and things where it's cyber now, you know, before it was information, information risk management, and that was always an IT thing, and have the IT people go figure stuff out and whatever firewalls, IT people will keep us safe. And then when, you know, as, as all the world started really moving to um, having a more free flow of information, you also started seeing that that information is valuable. And when the value is there, I mean, that, that unfortunately then sparks up another in, um, industry, which is, nef is a nefarious industry. Uh, and so, um, so I think it's having both talented people as well as tools. Uh, and so we have very sophisticated tools, which I will not go into, but we do. Um, and then it's something that there's also coalitions around this where, you know, say from the energy industry, these, these would be something would be things that we as an industry energy industry actually meet and share information on because when you think about national security say if somebody could get into you know one of the plants that i was talking so i was talking about like our advanced process controls where we have people you know that are remote being able to operate some of our things well if that's a bad person doing that think of the damage that they could cause and so from that standpoint, this isn't like colluding or trying to do anything like that. This is more of a, how do we, how do we uh, create a coalition to keep us safe? 
Um, and so really sharing information and how each other are, um, you know, protecting, um, you know, these digital assets, that's, that's one way um, that we do it. And then, you know, from the, you know, we, I think uh, my peer and uh, my boss, who's the CIO, they probably meet with the board quarterly. Um, and so this is something that's looked at. And so it's not just an IT thing. You know, it's something that all facets of um, our business um, are aware of, aware of the threat that's there and what are everybody's personal responsibility. Because think, think about it, somebody, it can just be as simple as clicking on a link to an email that you're not sure about that gets infiltrated. So, you know, we do white hat hacking and that's, you know, so there's a definitely a, um, component of that, which is awareness and teaching of personal responsibility, in addition to, like I said, the monitoring and tools that we have. And now, as far as the, the other things, um, one of the pieces that where I say that this in the last two years, what have we done um, in our digital transformation, we have gone to, so while I said we kind of have this matrix organization, it's also kind of decentralized. Um, which is, it's good from the standpoint where you can, again, get people with different, you know, strengths, say whether it's in drilling or in trading or in reservoir engineering and, and you know, they're all really strong and then they're out in all the different countries. Um, you know, in the past, everybody was kind of had a little bit, maybe too, too much autonomy. And so one of the things that we're trying, we're, we're doing now is we're really going to able, to be able to deliver these digital technologies in scale and scope, we are utilizing um, a logical construct of platforms uh, that are um, really uh, based on the different parts of the value chain. Um, so instead of each business unit, because we have 13 or so different business units and upstream, instead of each of them having their own tools, what we're looking to do is really have a subsurface platform. And so all of the digital tools that we will use um, to really enable exploration through production will be delivered through this digital platform. And then that way, that gets us to be able to really ensure that we have common applications and more important common data and that data can flow not only within that piece of the value stream but then it can go to you know our wells area or from our design through to decommissioning or into our um you know procurement area and so we have what we have a construct of 12 different kind of functional platforms, again, a logical construct that connect all the different pieces of our value chain and business, even our the corporate function areas. And then it's underpinned by an IT uh, platform so that we also have a very similar way, you know, that we have, you know, our cloud environment and our networking. And that's, that's one of the things that we're doing within our digital transformation is utilizing a more of this logical construct that we that will allow as innovation happens that we can innovate design once and then kind of deliver across um, and so that that is also helping to as opposed to in the past where you know you had to kind of stay in contact with these like 50 different uh, business units and what are they all doing and and what application did they pick and can this application talk to that application and had the application say this application you know had a different data definition for well versus this one and then you have to build things in the middle you get a lot of spaghetti as we call it um, and so we're trying to and that's that's one of with my role as the as it the gm of it engineering it really is having that engineering discipline within IT to build uh, both applications and data um, in a very similar way so that we can actually do data science and the analytics on top of it. Great, yeah, so um, I guess the, I know you can't get into kind of methods and whatever they call it, methods and models <laughs> on the cyber side because it give, might give the, uh, as you pointed out, uh, new ideas to the bad yeah. guys, as you put it. Uh, are, can you categorize sort of general, are you worried about uh, your equipment being taken over and disrupted, blown up, uh, 
people stealing uh, money, uh, oil, who knows? Uh, is there a way uh, to talk about general categories of risks that you uh, feel are important? It's kind of like what keeps you awake yeah. at night most yeah. at this point. Well, m money, the stuff that you just said. <laughs> so, uh, um, I mean, there's, there's definitely, we are concerned about, um, you know, when you start talking about the industrial internet of things, it's a very powerful thing to allow, you know, engineers and our geophysicists and geoscientists and our, you know, commercial folks to be able to, you know, get at data, um, you know, combine data um, in a very quick way to make um, really good business decisions. So that's the good side of it. The bad side of it, again, if, if it's not, if we don't have that secure, you can, you, you can, you definitely can have folks that can get in. And especially as you start talking about our, um, how highly instrumented our operations are, you know, if somebody is able to get in and, um, you know, either take that over or to fool an instrument to say that, you know, if there's, it's an instrument looking at a pressure and then the, you know, the pressure is within a certain range, but somehow, you know, you're able to go in and kind of say, oh, the pressure isn't there, or say even like a vessel where a vessel, you know, if you get in and like um, get to the kind of GPS, you know, a lot of the folks, you, know, you talk to a lot of the folks on our vessels today, and it's probably the same thing with, with I would think with, with uh, aviators, where a lot of these things, it's so auto, you know, automated that people don't know by hand how, you know, by hand, like steer these big vessels, right? And so, um, so it's those, those types of things that definitely do uh, keep us up at night. And those are, you know, we categorize them as kind of the, the highest potential of risk. And then we also look at the likelihood of them happening and then based on the, those risk matrix. So that's, that's really what our cyber is about. It's, it's very much a risk based and where do, where do we go? Very Bayesian, right in the yeah. uh, wheelhouse of ICME, uh, as we now call it uh, here, uh, for sure. Um, uh, hey, I did have I did have a couple of slides I wanted I wanted to say because I see we're getting close time. I, I actually wanted to go okay. to um, okay, go, go for it. Let me see here. So just a couple of things I want to talk about maybe the the softer side or the people side, but it's not even I don't even want to say softer because it's just as important. So so really, I mean, I talked about all the things, right? But the, the other piece of digital is really just learning. Um, there, is, there is a mindset shift um, about, you know, there, you know, we are in a, you know, a mature business. And so, as I said, that, that's why I said, if you, in the beginning, I said, if you ask people, we've been doing this forever, it's like, yes, but then there's also like, how do we do the same things that we've been doing, but solve them in very um, different ways. The other piece is, um, you know, because we're such a big business, long business, sometimes things take a really long time. And so trying to get people to think more from an agile standpoint and trying to be more iterative, because that, I mean, that really lends itself when you're, when you start thinking about uh, kind of doing transformation or breakthroughs, it really is about, um, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And so you can't have some sort of plan out where I'm going to do this, 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 and this. It's like, you kind of have to have, have hypotheses, test the hypotheses and kind of um, iterate. And then because technology is changing quite a bit, being, being that continuous learner and challenging yourself to continually uh, learn all these things. And I, and I talked about the collaborative nature and this transparency and information story. This is the thing for us to be able to get to that scale and scope where it's not, you know, the, again, the 40 different business units, it is, you know, a, you know, an entity, one big entity that is the company. And then how do we share so that we look across the world and that if somebody's come up with a great idea, we're able to quickly pick it up and replicate it um, across. And then finally, um, one of the things just to maybe leave with some of the students, as, as we really see going forward, we, we've um, kind of coined this phrase of, of digital translators um, because there is this intersection between the uh, kind of engineering technologies and the digital technologies because it, as I said, that, that whole piece of solving, um, you know, old problems maybe in a different way, there's, I mean, there's still, when we think about, you know, geoscience or geophysics, um, 
there's still the, um, you know, some of the, 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 the physics principles that you're going to go through. But then it's like, how do you blend that with some of the digital to um, help look at how we interpret in a very different way to maybe to, you know, drastically reduce the cycle time uh, that it takes. And so what we've found is people in our company who either from an academic standpoint actually have like dual degrees, you know, so somebody who has say a petroleum engineering degree and a statistics degree, or, you know, like say a, you know, a geophysics degree and a computer science degree. I mean, that's what we call digital translators or somebody in the company, maybe who came in again, academically, either in maybe that digital, you know, more of a CS or data science space and then learned, you know, but then was in, you know, either the upstream, midstream or downstream and really learned that engineering side. It's, it's in the translators where we find the magic to happen. Because if you have folks where you have folks that know computer science and know data science, but don't really understand the business of, in, of energy or the the fine uh, the fine workings of the different engineering aspects of drilling a well or exploring for it or doing the operations or doing the um, you know the the commercial trading or things like that um, they just know the tools and there could just be fancy cool tools or if you have somebody that only knows the petrotechnical side and has no clue of what the digital is, then there's this, there's this kind of huge schism in between. And, and it, you could almost be speaking a different language. And so that's why we call a translator. You need kind of that translator that kind of knows both sides and can say, hey, I kind of know enough about this to be able to talk your language, know enough about this to talk yours. And I think if you guys come together, some of the magic could happen. And so that's, that is what we're finding um, that that folks that are, are kind of there, we, we, need, we need deep technical folks on the both sides, on the petrotechnical side and on the digital technical side, but then we also need uh, translators. Interesting, so therefore your IT department is actually not only um, useful in, in, as, as such, but also uh, perhaps a facilitator of a change in corporate culture that brings these two disparate. So there's a lot of questions about that. How do you yes. make rapid transitions in a big old successful company? Uh, so you can do through the IT work with these. Uh, it's interesting you immediately love uh, a little recruiting plug in there to get, yes. that'll work much better if you have people who can actually play that role, which you yeah. called the- uh, And, and I've, actually, I've actually done that in my career. So, you know, I came into Chevron as a computer programmer based on my background. I was very fascinated by the piece of the business that I was in, which was that midstream piece of the business, which was the, um, you know, that commercial piece. And, um, and so then I went and I was like, well, I wanna learn more about what they do. And, um, and I got the opportunity, I was going to be building an app and they didn't have enough time, like people were too busy to kind of come and, and give me business requirements. And so it was like, okay, well, can I just go and sit with people? And that's what I did was I went for a month and I just sat with them and learned what they did. And the best thing for me was one day when, when the guy who was like my buddy was like, hey, I need to leave, why don't you cover my desk? And so I was covering his desk and I was using like the prototype that I had built and I was like, good Lord, this thing is clunky. And in my mind, I saw the code and I was like, well, this is an easy fix. I was like, I'll, this will take me about a half an hour to go fix this. And, um, you know, now that I'm using it. And so like when he came back and I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go fix this. I'll come back. And I came back and I, you know, it used to take him two hours to do something. And when, you know, I took a half an hour and then by the, when I like rewrote the code, it took him 15 minutes you know, but it was because I could see both sides. Like I knew exactly what he was doing. And I also knew that that was a really easy coding fix. And I just went and did it. So I think that's a, a great transition into your up close and personal with the students yeah. now, as you now are a, an even uh, more impressive role model for them than I, <laughs> that I thought an hour ago. Uh, so Alicia, thanks for your inspiring uh, talk. It is uh, important, I think, for big companies who can make changes quickly to get uh, 
uh, synchronized with uh, all that's going on in the world now, and you are doing so in many, many dimensions, some of which we didn't even get into today. Yeah, so yeah like that, to, that time uh, flew by, so sorry. I'm yeah, happy to, I, I'd like happy to, to hope, come back and share more. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope next time you'll be able to do so in person, Can you? Yeah. so you can, I'm not sure if we'll get it done by the time of your reunion, which may be, be delayed anyway. So thanks once again for an, an inspiring and eye-opening seminar. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.